Hey guys, it's Andy. No voicemails tonight. Uh, this week, we are actually premiering a new song, new single, actually. Yes, it's called Friends, a song about friends. And that's what basically what this song is about. Floyd wrote it and Sean wrote it. I wanted to write a riff song. They started writing it on the road and during quarantine, we all kind of finished the tune up. Um, it was one of the last songs uh, we finished for this new record that's going to come out that I can't talk about yet. But ladies and gentlemen, Chris, play the world premiere, the flutes. Give me the flutes, baby, because we got another single from Andy Frasco and the UN, my band. This song's called Friends, a song about friends. Enjoy, and let's start the show. Frasco's World Saving Podcast. I'm Andy Frasco. How's everyone doing? How's our heads? How's our minds? Are we um, enjoying fall? Hell yeah. Shout to fall. Let's go fall. I love fall. Oh man. I literally just got home. I uh, ran. This is, It was a great, dude, I'm, I'm telling you, this, this is, a, I don't know what they call this. Um, maybe it's just a down um, spiral. I'm not down spiral. It's not. I'm not spiraling. But um, it was just. It's been a crazy month. Uh, 
We played Memphis Fest, uh, Memphis Fest, which was uh, fucking awesome. Shout out to Memphis Fest. <laughs> Hell yeah, that was a blast. Memphis, you turned up for your boy. I appreciate it. Um, but dude, it was so fucking crazy. Um, well, I'll, t- I'll tell you everything that happened that week, but before we do that, talk about what I did and how you doing. Y'all good? Everyone taking care of themselves, taking care of their bodies, um, not letting anxiety uh, just just straight fuck us, you know? <laughs> just straight, no lube, just inwards. Don't let it get to you. Um, just know that things um, happen in your life and, um, you know, nothing is forever. And if we get in that mind state that nothing is forever and there's going to be bad days, but there's also going to be fucking amazing days, um, then we're going to get through this. We're going to get through anxiety. We're going to get through um, just being present, you know, just staying present. But, um, oh man, it was fucking crazy. I mean, I had two days off yesterday and um, I stayed in Seattle. Shout out to Seattle. That was a blast. And then I had two days. I went to Denver for two days and basically caught up on sleep and started watching that squid squid show, squid game. I didn't realize that just a bunch of people just fucking dying and stuff. I'm like, whoa, my anxiety cannot handle that right now. And, um, and then I got on a plane to get to Memphis Fest. I was going to go there Friday, take a day, chill. My flight gets... Uh, oh, that's what I did. I did Burke Kreischer's pocket. Oh, sorry. I flew to LA on Tuesday, went to Burke Kreischer's house. Shout out to Bert. Holy shit. I totally forgot about that. I did that before this fucking crazy story I'm about to tell you. Shout out to Burke Kreischer. That was, we, we talked for two and a half hours. We cried. I hugged. I tried to give him, well, I don't want to ruin it, but I tried to give him mushrooms. He was 11 a.m. He's like, I got two more podcasts. I can't do this with you, Frasco. But I took him and I was very vulnerable. <laughs> talked a lot. And he is just, me and him are just so fucking the same person. It's just crazy. And we had a great time. Um, so I was on his podcast, Birdcast. I don't know when he's going to post it. Maybe next week, maybe this week. But uh, catch that one. That's going to be a lot of fun. So I went to LA, fucking cloud nine. I'm hanging out. Like I'm I'm in with the comedians and, and they fucking love us and watch our songs. And he, Bert was talking about how he played Dancing Around My Grave before he went into surgery. He was really stressed out. And that song made him cry. And I'm just like, oh my fucking God, this is really happening. And... Um, and then we started talking about my life and I told, I, I think I spilled the beans about a little too much about my, my sex life throughout my life. But, um, two and a half hours, if you want to uh, hear me talk for two and a half hours, not like you already hear me enough talk for fucking every week on Tuesdays, but this is a little reverse. Um, me and Bert just talking shit and uh, get to know each other. You know, this is my first time even like meeting the dude, you know, besides just, you know, Instagram and what up, Bert? He's like, what up, Frasco? So it was really nice. Shout out to the whole family, Leanne, his wife, everybody, the kids. His house is fucking tight. Balling. The fool's pimping. I love it. Um, so I went to LA and I surprised it was my mom's 69th birthday. Hot. Hell yeah. Shout out to my mom. Happy 69th birthday, mom. Hell yeah. Great year. 69. Hope you make love to dad. Do some kinky shit, whatever. Um, I surprised her. We went to sushi and then I got on this flight on Friday and it was running a little late. Every All these flights, like all, my band, we we're all having trouble getting to Memphis on Friday. And um, my flight was like two hours late because I, I had a layover in Denver and um, I missed my flight. So I got to um, stay in Denver. My house was airbnb so <laughs> I got a hotel in my hometown. And uh, Scotty had tickets to um, to TK and the Holy Nothings, who were fucking badass, FYI. Shout out to TK. Jay Cobb from Fruition's in that band. That band is good. That band is going to blow up. I have a feeling. They have really good songs, and that show was fun at uh, Lost Lake. Shout out to Scott Campbell for getting me in and, and Scott Morrill for getting me in. I love you guys. Always taking care of me. I really feel, Denver really feels like home. And even if I'm only home for a day and I don't, you know, I don't have my house, you know, everyone's taking care. I mean, I fucking shout out to Denver one more time. I fucking love you, Denver. It's my people here. I fucking love you. You're the shit. So my flight got can- my second flight to Memphis from Denver to Memphis got canceled. So I stayed fucking binged, blacked out. I was like so sad. I was already kind of like bumming a little bit because it's just like so hard being on tour for five weeks i haven't done that in a while and just like just takes a lot out of you and you know you're trying to give it you're all every time and then um so i got on this flight 
day of show, which I hate doing because God forbid, you know, a lot of, you know, flying is weird right now. A lot of, yeah, a lot of flights get canceled. FY, Southwest, do better. Unbelievable. I'm going I'm to call you out. Southwest, do better. Your boy, I buy a lot of flights with Southwest. I'm like, yo, you know, hook me up with a hotel. You know, I don't want to go to the city, go hang out with someone, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let me just get a hotel by the thing. They're like, nope, you uh, have a Colorado license plate, so you know where to go. So good fucking luck. So I'm like, you know what? Suck my dick from the back, fucking Southwest. And I'm going to get a new flight. So I got United and they're homies. Shout out to United. That was dope. Thank you, United. <laughs> Hooking a brother up. I might go back to you. Had a lot of miles with United. They're like, no, what? we got you. Frasca, we got you. And so I got on my flight on fr- Saturday, and we play. A f- we were we're supposed to play at Memphis at four thirty. Got on my flight, you know, putting on my podcast. And I um, and you know, an hour into the flight, I look left and I see this um, older lady starting to have a seizure. And I was like, didn't think I was like. You know, when you're in fucking airplane mode, you're just like tunnel vision, you don't know like if someone's like just like like an anti-masker, just like you making a scene or whatever, yada yada. And uh, she started seizuring, and all of a sudden, I took off my headphones. I was listening to like a podcast or whatever, and every it felt like everything was really still. And all of a sudden, she passes out. And, uh, and she's like literally right next to me and I didn't know what to fucking do. I didn't, I've never seen someone have a seizure or, or start foaming and I, th- I think she was diabetic or I think there, she was trying to say she had low blood sugar and then she passes out and uh, two people run af- run like the, the all of a sudden like there's a there's like an announcement is there a doctor on the and I'm like I'm shell shocked. I've never seen anyone you know lose like consciousness after a seizure and die i think she died and uh all of a sudden i just see this you know i'm like going to this festival and i see this woman like dying on the plane and i start like having this panic attack and i don't want (laughs) i don't want this to like trigger my um everyone you know it's like and i start freaking out and then all of a sudden she passes out and her eyes close and you see like her body, like dying. And it was the craziest thing. And people were putting water on her and telling her to breathe and feeding her orange juice. And then she started, she passed out and they took her body and like, it was like took two dudes, took her body to the back of the plane. And all of a sudden we get the call from the pilot saying, we got to make an emergency. Um, We got to make an emergency um, landing in Wichita and we get to Wichita and everyone's freaking out. And like, I mean, I've never seen anyone die ever, you know, <laughs> like besides like, I still have, I still think about that scene in Saving Private Ryan where that guy watches that dude die with a knife and it, and I still have nightmares about it. And I saw this happen and I was so shell shocked. And all of a sudden ambulance, the, the plane lands, ambulance runs in with a chair and all of a sudden, the person disappears in the back of the plane. And uh, I think she died and I was, and everyone was kind of like not saying anything about it. And I'm like, it really traumatized me. And then I, and then they start, they start driving or flying back to Memphis. And then I land at 3.30. My set was, we were like two hours late and my set was at 4.30, 4.50. And I got on, and then like I was just like a zombie walking to the the festival transportation van with my and I told my I texted my tour manager I'm like yo someone just died on my plane and I don't know I'm fucking spooked and um, I get to Memphis and you know my boys are all you know I couldn't talk to anyone I was shell shocked and then like 20 minutes later I had to play in front of like fucking three or four thousand people. And it just made me realize, man, how fucking precious life is and how we really need to stop taking life for granted, you know? It's, it's fucking weird. Die, death, like I know we, we put it in the back of our heads. We don't want to think about 
the inevitable. We're all, you know, we're all going to die. And that's, you know, it's like just, and seeing that, I don't know if, I know maybe like some people have seen someone die or seen a shooting or maybe like someone in your family, um, you know, gets terminally ill and, you know, they're at their deathbed and you, you know, some people like see them go to the next ether. But it really gave me perspective of, you know, like I always think about the past and I always think about the future and, um, you know, and the time when I'm most present is on stage. And there was a moment where I was, I, I didn't know what to do because that's, that was my sanctuary. And I just want to shout out to Memphis, Tennessee for waking me up. Oh man, I want to cry. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Memphis, Tennessee for um for getting me out of, you know, the funk and and uh so I could try to do my part to make people present, you know? And um I uh I wanted to explain that I I mean I literally just got home from this whole like shell shocked from it from Memphis. My house was Airbnb yesterday, so I just got home and I'm finally like decompressing from the fucking weekend because the show was amazing. People were crying and like there for me and fucking thought it was such a great set. And I was really just, I was really proud of our set. I'm going to give one more shout out to the band. We played great and I wasn't there for a second and I woke up and I, I basically dedicated that whole set to that grandma I saw who, um, on that plane. And, uh, I hope, you know, you don't, this, you, uh, this grandma doesn't know me for anything. <laughs> so I, she probably didn't even know I was on the plane. And, um, you know, life is precious. It's never, you never know when it's your turn to leave the party or this beautiful life, you know, even when it's shitty, it's going to be fucking sh- I had a, This whole fucking tour, five weeks of just getting punched and punched and punched and punched. Um, and to just keep keep my nose down and n- know that you what you're doing is for the better you know because when you're present when you're making people happy i mean i don't i'm i'm talking i'm pumping trying to pump myself up here when I, when you make people happy and that's what gets me happy and that's what gets me present and um for for people to um come out and support me and that was such a huge crowd and I was not expecting that I, I you know I, we've played in Memphis a couple times maybe for 100 people 200 people but it's it was just amazing to see the whole city just fucking come out there and fucking be there for me and um and um I'll celebrate life together because if there's one thing this seeing death <laughs> right in front of your face taught me is how precious it is to be on this earth and how precious it is to have companions, friends, and um, to know that you're not alone. So if you're feeling alone, feeling like you just have so much stuff built in your brain and your and your gut and you're fucking suppressing everything, just let it out. Don't hold that shit in because you don't want to be that person who um or 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 if you have an accidental death or whatever and you're regretting it on your when when you're dying that you wish you were more honest with yourself and you wish you were more honest with the people around you let's live for each other let's have each other's backs let's support one another shout out to those two people helping that grandma out too fuck yeah fuck yeah you didn't know them one guy left with the plane just to make sure she wasn't alone. Even if, I don't, see, I don't even, she, I'm, I'm praying she is alive, but I don't think she's alive. But that guy was a good fucking guy. And I would have done the same fucking thing. Um, so take care of each other. Take care of your brothers and sisters. Life is too fucking precious. I'll say it again. Life is too fucking precious and we need to, to have each other's backs. And I know it's weird to uh, promote a company right now, but Repsy has my back too. <laughs> Shout out to Repsy. <laughs> Taking care of me. Podcasting. Let me be vulnerable on, on, a, on an outlet that lets me talk about these things. Because normally, normally I just suppress shit. 
I just suppress. And before this podcast, I, I was never able to communicate my feelings. And, and that's why I, I dove into drinking. And that's why I dove into drugs. And now that I have an outlet to express myself and express the, the, the thoughts in my brain and in my gut that fucking make me nervous and make me stressed out and make, make me um, hard to deal with. Um, I, I just hope everyone has that opportunity because you don't want to keep that shit in. Fuck it. You know, life is too short to feel shitty over something you did yesterday or when you're fucking eight years old or 12 years old. Get it out of your body. Talk to someone. If you need to talk to a therapist, can't afford a therapist, you got backline for all those music people. If you can't afford backline or too scared to talk to a therapist, talk to a friend. Tell your mom you love them. Tell your dad you love them, grandpa. Get those that stuff out of your body because we don't want to regret it when it's our time to go. And um, Repsy is has been so good and so supportive. And if you're in a band, it's so supportive to me. And if you're in a band or an artist or a DJ or or um, a comedian, sign up for Repsy and get your name out there and get your get your words out. Because like I said, we don't want to regret anything. We should give life 125%. And that's why I got Adam Deitz from Lettuce on the show today. Um, I literally interviewed him <laughs> five minutes. I got off my plane. I'm like, fuck. Um, I didn't, you know, and, and Deitz was like, I'll do the interview. I'm like a fucking G. So shout out to Adam Deitz. <laughs> Getting me. And it was a fucking great one. We did an hour and a half of just talking about his life and talking about the hardships and talking about how much he loves fucking music. And it was such a great interview. I think you're going to love it. And we got Nick. Shout out to Nick for bringing all the podcast stuff. I left my podcast stuff with Bo and Bo is taking four days off as he deserves. Shout out to Bo. (laughs) Clapping for everyone today because life is short. We need to clap for our friends. We need to clap it up. It's going to be a -a clap-a-thon this whole episode because we're here to support each other. Um, so shout out to Gerlock for getting me the fucking podcast machine. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even think about it. I'm like fucking so in my head from this death and having such an amazing show and like really a turning point in, in the Tennessee with, for my band and we're all crying and shit. It was fucking heavy. And I got to see Dave. I haven't seen Dave schools for two years and watching him be happy and just, oh, it was such a special moment. Menful Fest, I will remember you forever. That and you guys took care of me, all the club, or the bookers, to the promoters, to everyone, you guys took care of me. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was a hard weekend for me, and you guys made me feel like a fucking rock star. And I, fuck yeah, thank you. All right, guys. Um, let's listen to that Adam Deitch interview. Let's be present. Let's have a great fucking week. Shout out to the internet going down yes today. I loved it. I didn't have no promoting... Now, watching people's, it was like a day off. I think I needed that day off of just oversaturation and stuff. So let's listen to Deitch fucking talk about how passionate he is about music. He's got a crazy life. He's worked with everybody. He, the man has worked with everybody, um, and I think you're going to love it. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a great week, and I hope you like that single. I just put out a new single. I didn't even talk about that yet. Um, friends. Uh, that song you heard, it's coming out tomorrow, but you know, podcast gets exclusive love on the sh- on it. And it actually, as I think about it, it's a perfect song to um, for this episode because it is friends. Let's be friends again. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're a Wook or a fucking Chad or Karen. Um, let's just try to understand each other. That's all it is. And that's what that song's about. Shout out to Floyd and Sean for writing that tune, helping us and putting it on our new record. I think you're going to love this new record. So this is the second single off the new record um, that I shouldn't talk about because we haven't announced yet, but there's going to be a new record coming out next year. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, I'm really proud of these fucking songs. The band's proud. We're, we're, this is, this is, this is, I'm, we're really proud of this record. And I think you will be too. So without further ado, let's have a great fucking week. I'm going to play the music for everybody. Let's have a great fucking week. I know we're going to... This fucking quarantine sucks. The COVID's scary. 
everyone off <laughs> social media. They thought the world was ending. I literally saw people say the world thought the world was ending because fucking social media was going. I'm like, oh my god, get off your soapbox. Let's have a great week. Let's fucking kill it. Let's be optimistic, and for God damn it, let's live in the now because that is what's important. Nothing else besides living in the now. All right, guys, you ready to have a great week? I am. I'm gonna fucking get this shit. Got a five days off until the Ogden, baby. We're playing Denver. Denver, Colorado, come to the fucking show. We got sit-ins. We got Betty Bloom. We got Adam Dites. We got the Denver homies are coming in. So get your tickets and um, enjoy Adam Dites on the World Saving Podcast. I love you. Next up on the interview hour, we have Adam Deitch from Lettuce from Break Science, from Pretty Lights. This man, yo, play some lettuce, Chris. <laughs> Deitch is one of the best drummers on the planet. Um, and how compassionate he is about the music community and how hardworking, I mean, the man's story, this story is crazy. Like, my, my mouth dropped. Like, really, really, really. He's a hard worker. And um, he not without any luck. There's no luck involved in his story. He's a fucking grinder. He wants to be the best, and he is the best. And for that, I thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy Adam Deitch from Lettuce. Adam Deitch. Welcome to the show. Good to be here, man. Thanks. To, we, we get to finally hang out one-on-one. Finally. How's it going? Real good. Real good. Just a beautiful day here in Colorado. Yeah. You doing good? Doing great. How's uh, how's your head these days? It's, uh, you know, it's and I'm, I'm in a good place. Good. I'm in a really good place where we got some gigs happening, COVID willing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you know, just getting back on tour is what we need as human beings. So. Well, let's talk about the human experience with music. I mean, you're such a, you're like, your blood is music from your family, from how you grew up, from your education. How important is music to you? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, everyone says like, it's not who I am. It's just what I do. You know, it really is who I am. Yeah. You know, it's just growing up with my parents' record collection, all their knowledge. And my great uncle was a, a big band drummer in the 40s and 50s and traveled oh, crazy played with like the paul whiteman orchestra and all this shit so yeah he, it's just like generational thing in my family that we just gravitate towards i guess what is your family what why did your family like all fall in love with drums uh it starts with uncle dave probably you know him being really successful and he had his own radio show in new york what was it called um it was on CBS radio. It was Dave Abrams and the Nutcrackers. Hell yeah. <laughs> that was his band, the <laughs> Nutcrackers. And, and then, you know, he was the drummer and the arranger, the band leader. And, you know, it's like a picture of him sitting in front of the piano with everybody behind him, you know. And that was his gig. And, like, everyone in the family knew he was a success- successful drummer and band leader, you know. So uh, he kind of passed that to my dad and my, and my grandmother, of course, his brother, Dave's, bro- Dave's sister. She was super supportive of my dad, so... It just got passed down, and my mom also had um, an uncle who played drums, also. So they were pretty supportive of my mom playing drums, also. That's crazy, man. Like, uh, I feel like there's got to be like this, like <laughs> stress to be great with having so many great players <laughs> in your fucking family, right? It's you know, they always say ignorance is bliss. You know, if you <laughs> if you don't know a lot of the musicians out there, you could really like get into your thing and like know who you are. But if you are aware of everybody, you know, like from the Max Roaches, the Roy Haynes, the great jazz drummers and all the funk cats, all the like B-side funk cats that people don't know that are just incredible. So I grew up being very like, yeah, it's a lot of pressure and it was like a lot of insecurities involved, you know, like I'll never be this or that or that. But the love was there, so that kind of superseded the, you know, fuck, I'm not good enough. Yeah, with that, though, did you have a lot of anxiety when you were a kid? Um, I was too busy skateboarding from 12 really? to 17. I, I got away from music for a little bit. Why? You know? 
it was just like hip hop and skateboarding in 1991 was just like, you know, street skating kind of vibe, New York. Yeah, you were living in the city, right? Or kind of close? I was right. I was a half an hour north of the city, you know. Close enough. We were trying to be city kids more than city kids, you know. Yeah. Were you a good student? <laughs> Or did you, all you care about was just skating and music and? Um, I, you know, my parents were both teachers and they're really into education. They were getting their masters when I was in like eighth, ninth grade. Mm -hmm. Went back to school, night school and shit. Oh, sure. So education's cool. I just I wasn't like an A student. I was like, you know, they made sure I stayed around B's and occasional C's. So like they didn't give you shit. Oh well, you that's good enough for them to leave you alone. Yeah, it was enough. They, they knew I was doing my best, you know, like, you know, I was definitely playing drums four hours a day, you know, zoning out, you know. Really? Yeah. Well, you, what time? How old? Uh, forever, since I was like five, six. So why did you take that break between 12 and 17? I just don't need to get out of the house, man. Yeah. <laughs> I was in the basement, <laughs> yeah, bro. I know. You were talking about this basement life. Yeah. Like, you were just stuck in the basement. Like, did you have friends or did, were you kind of like a loner or how'd you get so good? I mean, my friends would come over and be like, let's go out. And I, I would be practicing Friday night, you know, and like lose track of time. And, they, I, I, you know, they're like, let's go, let's go do something, you know. So I was just kind of like always in the house. And and uh, then skateboarding was like, okay, let's be social. Let's get out. And oh, so that was your like getaway. That was my get out. Yeah. That was my like, okay, who who am I outside of this room? You ever fuck yourself up? Uh, not super bad. You know, I scraped. So I, I fell and I hit my face once and I wasn't supposed to be skateboarding because my, my parents would take my board away when I fucked up in school or some Hell shit. Yeah. So I had someone else's board and I fell on a curb, my face bashed and I had to lie and say I got in a fight. Oh shit. And then yeah. what, how'd you, how'd you get out of that? Like, what, tell me the story. How'd you, what'd you tell I mean, your parents? I, I, I was just like, I, you know, my boy punched me in the face, you know, and they, and they were like, why? I come up with the story, you know, it's just, just what was so, the story. Uh, I was like, I, yeah, I, I forget what the fucking story was. It's so long ago, man. I was like 13. Yeah. But they believe me and, uh, you know, I live to skate another day. That's great. I mean, that's, it's gotta be, I don't know. It's gotta be, I, I used to lie a lot when I was a kid because I was just like worried about how my parents will react to who I was mm -hmm. as a person. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, I just think about like the competitiveness that, that there's gotta be through that like you not even knowing about competitiveness because your whole family is a bunch of brilliant musicians. There's got to be that in you that drove you to be great at whatever you wanted to be great at. Or was, did, did that not matter? It, it was just fun, man. Really? It wasn't even like a thought of greatness or, you know, no shit. Any of that shit. It was just like, this is what I like. I get, this is a thing called the funk rush. My dad always, you know, he had a name for it, the funk rush, when you're playing a groove. It could be any, anything, playing reggae, jazz, whatever. And you feel like, you're you know, your skin starts to bug out and your hair stands up and, yeah. and it's a real rush, you know? Oh my God. And uh, that's the shit that I chase, you know, it's a drug. What was the first show that you got that rush at? I mean, playing along with records just growing up. It's my parents' record collection. Earth, Wind, and Fire, you're playing along with the record and all of a sudden you're like inside it. And you kind of envision in your mind like you're on stage with them. You're like in the zone. Close your eyes, you know, and and you, you be, once you become part of that record, you're you start to like you know get excited. So that do you have a good imagination? I mean, you know, I try to definitely. Yeah, I definitely live in my own world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I bet. I mean, you got to when you're if you get those chills from just pretending to be somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, that shit's amazing. Isn't that an amazing drug? <laughs> it really is. It's my favorite drug, you know, being an only child also growing up. So just like me and the dog, you know. Was that hard to be an only child? Well, you know, the drums and, you know, and music and making beats for my friends, my rapper friends, that, that kind of took my time away from thinking about, and my dad was young. My dad's only like 22 years older than me. So oh, he was kind no of, shit. Yeah, it's like, was it an accident or? No, knew. it was real. It, it was, was for real. Yeah, they got married at 21, had me at 22, 23. And then yeah. they, what were they studying? They were, my mom was studying education to be an educator, but she was also taking drum classes and keyboard and everything. And, and are you talking about their master shit or their yeah, college Yeah, just shit? like, just when you were a kid, what were they studying? Um, they were, they're they always studying music, you know, they're always, you know, my dad was like learning to write classical pieces and study, get his master's in classical shit and 12 tone systems and all kinds of weird classical 
theories and shit. Holy shit. So at 17, when you wanted to get back in it, like mm-hmm. hard, like what was that epiphany? Like what, do you remember that day? Well, you know, I was playing a little around town, doing little things, you know. I was playing a gospel church around town. And I, I, it was a really great experience playing gospel music. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, the cat would like pick me up and he would actually uh, have a little J in his, you know, J on him and we were like, Hit a little J. You were smoking weed oh, early? Yeah, yeah, you know. How old were you? I was like 14, 15, 16, you know. You never got into drugs or anything? Young? Uh, no, nah, no. Nah. Just straight Just music. Weed, weed, weed and music. Weed and music, man. Holy shit. Yeah, I didn't even drink until I was like 35. No shit? Why? Not why, like. We were like the rap, the, the rappers I was producing for, they were like the weed only crew. And like they kind of were on some like, fuck these drunk yeah. motherfuckers. You yeah, know, yeah, like, kind yeah, of yeah. on that shit. So every Friday, Saturday night, we was just like blunts galore and, uh, you know, just beats blaring. You know, that's when I was like, wasn't playing drums. I was like 16, 17, 18, around there. And then what about, so who were your first mentors when you were 16, 17 besides your parents? Oh, mentor. I mean, just the cats I played with at church. Uh, Dale, my boy Dale, he, you know, he was a correctional officer. It's Sing Sing, you know, like a real no you know, shit, serious hard prison. Ass. Yeah, but he was a cool dude. He ended up being a cop and... uh but he was really cool, and he kind of mentored me in the, the gospel, funk, R and B thing. We had a gig at like a local, you know, black club that was super popping, and um, really like all they wanted to hear was R and B all night. And I got to play that music, so it really helped out. Dude, it's crazy! Like, uh, what did they teach besides like, what did he teach you about life that your parents couldn't teach you? I mean. A lot about the culture, man. The culture behind R and B, gospel, blues, jazz, funk, you know, just black culture, you know, and um just getting kind of adopted by him and, and my my boy Steve Estevern also was a big influence and just kind of played every instrument. Church grew up playing church and just kind of it's like, Oh yeah, you wanna learn these chords? Go ahead. Oh oh bass word, you know, and he was all kind of cocky about it like oh i'm so nice on bass i'm so <laughs> yeah, yeah check me out on guitar bro like it, it, he made it seem really cool like to be good at every instrument yeah you know like and then we go play basketball and he like bust my ass you know one-on-one he was like six one you know so you were into sports i was into basketball baseball i mean and, 90s were a good time for new york sports they were uh, I, the 90s i was real skateboarded out i okay. was like I, I didn't fuck with team sports i was like you know strictly street skating but uh, at, when Jordan came back to the league, it was like, okay, who's this guy that I miss playing in his prime? Yeah. And then he started busting everyone's ass really? at 38, you know. Whole, oh, I, so you didn't really get into Jordan until he was later in his Later, career. when he came back to the Wizards. That, that's when I was like, bam, I'm like, I'm into this now, you know. What did, what, do you see any similarities in uh, basketball and music? Absolutely, man. It's five on, you know, you know, lettuce is six guys, but having a team and getting psyched, go out there and perform and pass the ball. And yeah. not be a hog, yeah. and all those things, and and also the improv of basketball, which is like it's got the most improvisation of any professional sport, in my opinion. Tell me about it. You know, just the shakes, the, the shimmies, the <laughs> crossovers, the you know, the the god sham god move. You yeah. know, it's like it's, a lot of it is improv, and like Kyrie is dominating the league, you know, and he's an improvisational player. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's also anti-vax, but that's a yeah. Story. We'll talk about that later. What are you doing, <laughs> yeah. man? Come on, bro. <laughs> I'm not- but, uh, you know, he, Kyrie is, a, is an improviser on the court, yeah. you know, and that's, you know, he's also a point guard. So, you know, his assists are up. And Were you a good basketball player or you just love watching it? I mean, I grew up in New York. No. Nah. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I mean, I, you know, like I had some good nights. Yeah. I had, where, you know, I got a hook shot because everyone's taller than me. So, yeah. you know, yeah. my hook goes in. You Hell know, yeah. I will hook it over. I'll shout yeah. out to that. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, nice. So, like. You getting back into music at 17 and then all of a sudden going to Berkeley two years later. Like, that's insane. Like, were you not playing at all or were you playing a little bit? Like, you just had it in you? I I just had given up, man. It was like, I thought I wasn't good enough, you know. And then my mom was like, you got to try this Berkeley thing where you go to for a summer to Boston and you, you you know, you're 16 years old and you you stay in Boston for a, a month, five weeks, you know. And uh, my first time away from home that long. And there was, Jesus was there, mm-hmm. Shemines, Zoidis. At the summer camp? At the summer camp Shut thing. the fuck up. Praz, and we, and we just met through like hangs and weed. and. Who's the first friend you met? Uh, Shemines. 
Okay, so that's your boy boy? Yeah, that's my super number one, day one, yeah. And what, where's he from? He's from Westchester, right, Freshchester, right Fresh across the road. Yeah, yeah. So what, how'd you meet Shreen? Uh, he was in the room next to me. I, I was practicing my drums, fucking it up, and he was next to me playing his guitar, and I, you know, and I was like, who's this fuck? You know, he sounds so he great. So he was badass at high school? Badass, like just being, do 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 no, 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 no. He was singing, uh, let me stand next to your fire. Like, getting it. <laughs> and I was like, this dude. And I knocked on his window and I was like, well, what's your name? Where are you from? You know, that was my shit. Like, at school, I would just knock on people's practice rooms. Be like, what's up? Killing, you know? Like, oh, so you weren't afraid to, like, talk to people. Well, I, once I got to a school of all musicians, I was like, oh, freaks like me. Like, weirdos that are totally into, like, getting better. But it's like you're 16, you're kind of over music. Like, what was, made you switch? It was just like meeting those guys, you know, playing with Shemines, and he, he knew Kraz, and, you know, I ran to Jesus at, a, at like, a funk jam session that was happening. So it was like, when I met those guys, like, oh, you want to, you guys like hip-hop, and you like funk, and you're cool, and you smoke weed. Like, I had never had that. You yeah. Know? It was like, I was just always just a weirdo playing with older cats, you know? Was, uh, did you feel like high school was like, you just were stuck in a room with people you didn't like? I, there just wasn't enough talent pool in mm -hmm. my neighborhood for me to really be excited about practicing and everything. You know what I Damn, mean? Damn, you were just good and bored, dog. I was bored. <laughs> I, I spent every day, man, from five to like, you know, Holy 13, shit. like playing for hours, man. And like playing with everybody, older people, my parents, friends, and like, and I was just like, man, it's like, oh, I need to meet some kids my own age. Did they, know? they knew you were good though. They, they knew I, my mom had a lot of belief. Yeah. You know. Holy shit. Okay, so you get to Berkeley, you're it's and you're just a skater kid and like kind of felt like you wanted to quit or like you're still on that or did you feel like it was it was that moment when you met all these dudes who are like you're like, "Hey, actually there is a community that of weirdos just like me." Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exactly it, you know. We started we had that first jam. Where was it? it? Tell me. It. it was in the basement of the Commonwealth Avenue dorms at Berkeley. <laughs> Hell yeah. And we put up a sign like in use. You're not supposed to do that. Like you're supposed to have an hour or two tops and we played for like nine hours straight. You know, like people were lying, like listening. Homies started coming in, sitting down just at the corners listening, you know, like. Kraz was there too? Kraz was right there. Yeah. Okay, so you met Shmeens. And then who'd you meet? Shmeens met Jesus and uh, Shmeens knew Kraz and Kraz knew Zoidus and that was it. Did you have anyone else in your band that's not in your band now? That was the original homies. Uh huh. Um, we tried out. We had a couple different keyboard players. You know, uh, one was Jeff, who ended up winning producer of the year, the Grammys, and what the fuck? like wrote 808s and Heartbreak with. Kanye Did you know he was going to be that super talent? We knew he was just a super genius. He has free association with lyrics, so he's like lyrics, just bang, boom, 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 boom. Got the song, got the hit, got the thing. He can play every chord. He did wedding bands for years, so he knows every song, and he could flip it backwards. And you know, he's... were you religious? Was that were you not, religious? My dad is from a Jewish family that was so fucked up by the Holocaust that they kind of denied, they kind of just wanted to just be American. Oh, fuck. So we had a Christmas tree, the Jewish side of the family, with uh, a Jewish star on top. Is suppression big in your family? Not really. No? Uh, no. Just, just it older was just, generations yeah. of your family? It was just like, let's just be American and not worry about, you know, putting, you know, our Judaism first kind of family. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And my mom's side's Irish Catholic. Damn, that's a lot of guilt. Yeah. Jewish and Catholic, <laughs> dog. That's, that's me too. I'm Jewish and Catholic. My dad's Catholic. My mom's Jewish. No way. So you're, yeah, you're, Jew up. We call that a half. Oh, half? Hell yeah. Half. Shout, shout out to that yeah, too. Let's dude. go. Yeah. Up, dog. Yeah. We're bonded. Okay, good. That's me, you, Kraz. Yeah, Kraz. Me, you, Kraz, Benny. Benny is a. It's very happy. rare to have bi religional fan, uh, friends. Yeah. You know, most a lot of people are biracial, but not a lot of people have different parents of different religions. So why did you decide gospel music? Because that was, was where the best musicians that's were? That's where the cats were, man. Oh, you know, awesome. And the, the dude at school, you know, Steve at the jazz band, is like, you got to come to my church, man. You're better than the drummer in my church. <laughs> and I was like, really? He's like, he don't even want to play no more. You, you're the drummer in my church now. Were you getting paid? It was a little money. Like a oh, yeah. hundred bucks? Yeah. Bucks. yeah. You get a little gas money. Dude, did you have to drive? You didn't really drive because you lived in the city, right? I've, I still don't drive, bro. You still don't drive? I Fuck, do not drive. Dude, car. shout out to that. <laughs> you, don't need, you don't need that responsibility. Your brain's at... You talk uh, about that mm. thing about lyrics and shit with your homie. <laughs> yeah. Are you the same way with drums? How'd you learn that? Just we, like free mind. Free, don't overthink it. 
Wait, 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 explain your question one more time. Your guy, well, I forgot his name. The guy who's so good. The guy who uh, did all the Kanye stuff. A uh, Jeff. 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 So yeah. you thought he's like just so free willed with, with just lyrics and just being an open vessel, I guess. Yeah. Let the music come in. Yeah. Were you like that with drums, or did it take a while for you to get that? I mean, it always takes a while, man. It's just sometimes it flows and sometimes it's blocks, you know. Mm -hmm. But you just gotta you gotta live for the times that it flow. It mm -hmm. flows, you know. Do you take that philosophy with life? Absolutely. You know, you can't get frustrated with the blockage, you know, because you know that the highway is going to open up, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be traffic, you know. Have you ever had any blockage in your life that you felt like it was never going to go away? That's an amazing question. Blockage in my life. Um, being, a, you know, being a music addict and traveling all the time, you know, since I'm 22, my first touring gig with Average White Band. It's like it's a 70s nuts, funk bro. band. It's fucking nuts. I'm on the tour with like 60-year-olds, and they're like, you know, warming up, gargling with scotch, you know. Like, they, you know, they've been, you know, they sold millions of records and toured with Earth, Wind & Fire, all my favorite bands. Were they bitter because they're older? Or? No, they were super happy. They, were, they, were, they, they knew they made their mark on music, and, uh, you know, they opened up for Marvin Gaye and the crowd was in shock that it was like five white guys from Scotland on stage, you know, <laughs> Holy like, shit. yeah, like, but as soon as I started playing, the crowd went nuts, you know, that they just have the shit. So they, you know, we ended up opening for Ohio Players and, you know, Tower Power and all my favorite bands. And I'm just like the kid, like hanging out with my idols and shit. So go back to the blockage. So, but what's that? Go back to the, the blockage, blockage. Be, meaning like I was, I was so addicted to traveling from that age that I kind of don't have a lot of life skills, yeah, <laughs> you same, know, bro. like, you know, like cooking is like new, like since, since the pandemic happened, I learned how to do a lot of human things yeah. that normal humans are like, Oh, you don't do that. Do you feel like cause of that, you feel like you're always been an outcast a little bit. I'm, I don't feel like I'm as like, complete a human as a lot of people yeah. are, you know, like, Oh, you set up that TV stand. Wow. <laughs> Like, how do you, how do you, like, uh, read directions on an Ikea? Like, you know, like, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. the same fucking way, dude. I yeah. went on the road when I was 18. Okay. Straight. 250 yeah. shows a year since. I'm Ben. Mm -hmm. I don't. Applause. applause. Oh, hell yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that. I got the applause of dice, dude. I'll take that. But, like, I, I, I'm the same way, too. I felt like I wasn't, I felt like I was, like, um, what are they, like, not damaged, but, like, I just felt like I was different and it was hard for me mm -hmm. to like have a girlfriend and have yeah. like a relationship and like feel comfortable and just like doing something that isn't on a routine where i'm traveling or going to sound check driving five hours blah blah, blah whatever mm -hmm. it is like when did it hit you like oh shit this is did you ever have like depression about that? Like, fuck, I have to go back into real life for four months or something. It's really wild, you know, but I've never even had a break till the pandemic. Same. I would have went straight to 70 or like till an injury or some shit, you know, and I'm just so happy that, you know, I was able to experience what it's like to just be around for a while. Yeah. You know, it's like. What about the, so were you bumming during the pandemic? Because that was like the first really existential crisis you really had in your life. I, I loved it. Really? I loved it. I loved making music every day, you know, getting better at guitar, at bass. I wrote like, you know, 30 letter songs, 20 break science joints, you know, like just felt really inspired with my quartet. Just kept writing and writing and writing. Every day you wake up to do that. It's like the thing you want to get to, you mm -hmm. know? So like touring wasn't the thing you wanted to do. You just wanted to make new music. Yeah. I, I realized that that's a serious passion of mine. I've kind of forgot about because touring kind of takes the precedence and also just cooking and doing normal stuff and being a human. Yeah. Going out and see what people do on the weekends. Like what do people do on Fridays? <laughs> yeah. You exactly. Know, like, Wait, we could just stay at home and watch television. Right. <laughs> it's so weird. It's so weird. <laughs> or like go to, just go out and like where people are just hanging out, drinking wine. You're yeah. like, wow, this is like what people do on the weekend. Like, did you freak out when you first were able to do that? It was, it, it was kind of strange. Yeah. I, I gotta admit, you know, I'm kind of getting used to it now. What about like, did you ever like take a chance to fall in love when you were a kid? Um, Besides that other relationship you were just in, but yeah, I mean, I've had a couple great relationships. They all seem to last about seven years for some reason. Damn, you know, I've, you know, I've had some wonderful, you know, people in my life, and uh, very thankful for that, you know. But uh, my touring just kind of took me away from them and what they deserved as a human being. I think, you know, to really 
you know, be happy and get get that attention, have someone there for them. You know, I felt guilty if I wasn't yeah, there. Yeah, the guilt, that's what it is. You feel you guilty know? that you can't give them all the love. Yeah, and, like, they're great people and you really, they really deserve someone there day in, day out. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you know. Does that put a lot of pressure on in your head? Like, you're not, this person is, like, basically compromising for me and if am I compromising for them? Mm-hmm. Was that hard for you to think it's about? very hard. It's very hard. I feel bad, like, you know. You know, but but we're gonna be close, you know, spiritually forever. You know, both of them. You know, shout out to Eileen and Tanya. Yeah, shout out, shout out to the girls. You know, and um, seven years though. Yeah, so you so, always. So you, are you? Is commitment important to you? Absolutely. I come from my parents. You know, been together since twenty one. I really value a true like best friendship and relationship with you know with a partner. You know, did you feel you had that in your earlier bands before Lettuce? Um, I didn't really have any bands before Lettuce, man. I thought like uh, the the when you're doing like side gigs or filling in for people on tour. Well, I mean, those were like you know you're on a gig, you're like you're a hired gun, you yeah. know, so you don't feel like a part of something really. You're just like there to fulfill your job, and mm-hmm. you're happy you make money making music, and that's cool, you know, like. Cause I don't really, I couldn't really work at Dunkin' Donuts. I wouldn't even yeah. know how to get a regular job. Like I would, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, I would have no idea what to do in life besides that. So I was happy just being a side man. But the, you know, lettuce is the first thing. It was like, hey, we're friends and we're in a band and this is real. You know. So like, okay, so you now you're you're grinding. So you when did you find out lettuce was real? Uh, it was day one, man. We're sixteen. You know. It's so insane. Did you guys know that? Yeah, we we came to school two uh, two years later as a gang. We were like a straight. You know, gang, we, like everyone's all nervous in school first day and they're like trying to meet people. And so we, was it senior year that you did the summer? Like going it was, into senior year? It was year? sophomore year, high school. So you had two years without them yeah. or were you keeping two, in touch? Keeping in touch, hollering, hanging out with Shemeens. He was taking me to shows and like bringing, we would go see things and come over hang out once in a while, you know? And I kept in touch with Jesus and everybody, you know? Okay, so now you get to Berkeley. Yeah. You're 18, 19. You have a fucking gang. You have a posse. Gang, you have a posse. you have a real friend, like yeah. a real friends, yeah. like brothers. At the most important time of your life, when you really need like the homies, the new homies. You're away from home. You're in Boston. You're not in New York anymore. You know, and you need that crew. And we just had the crew. You know, and especially being an only child, yes, you never it, really had a brother. I didn't. Yeah, that was kind of the you know important for me. Yeah, the brother thing. Yeah, yeah, because there's only, like you said, there's only so much you could talk to your fifty year old uncle about you, yeah. know, you can't talk about pussy i mean maybe you could but like you know not like how you could really talk about pussy or like you whatever you, whatever you do i know your your music is yeah is they're everything brain, they're, everything yeah they're brotherly they're, yeah, stuff it's brotherly shit yeah so you get the, you get to berkeley mm. you guys we're gonna fuck this shit up mm. did you was it just like right away you you knew that we're all getting there we're getting the band back together and we're gonna fuck shit up or was it like kind of like a slow grind you because college is d- new to people right like yeah. you get all these new things you're in a dorm and it's lucky you didn't drink. I started. That's when I started drinking. Was in twenty nineteen when I was in high, uh, college for that one semester. And yeah. um, so, tell me about those years in Boston. Like, what did you guys graduate? Or I don't know. No, no. We were. I mean, did Crash tell you the story? No. Berkeley story. No, no, no. <laughs> you left that out, huh? Yeah, yeah. You didn't. Yeah. <laughs> this has never really been told. Tell me. I won't even say which members. I'm gonna say two members of the band were uh, involved in an incident in their dorm room with. Uh, some uh greeneries some uh-huh. some weed and uh and massachusetts don't fuck around with that at shit. that point no and neither did the school and they were expelled oh fuck yes so did you guys have to make a decision this might have to be edited that's but, fine that's but, fine but, well, you talk to ask your boys. yeah yeah i'll talk you yeah, ask Kras. Right. Right. we can say that okay that's fine <laughs> we're all we're all adults now but okay this happened they now the posse is splintered oh. two of our homies i'm gonna say it whatever Kras and yeah. So I just got kicked out, and now we're like missing two vital parts to the band and your you friends. Know? Yeah, and our best and like you know t- you know they're like both huge personalities. Yeah. And like we were like, damn, and it was like we were like, what now? You know, and we had to figure some shit out. You know, so we started like another thing called the formula, which was like we were trying to do like a hip hop thing. You know, it was mm-hmm. like the roots were out, like early roots in '94. You know, so. We started doing some hip hop shit. You could smoke in here too. Yeah, um, I'm down. I'm six too. Whatever, it's my house. Doesn't matter. Um, oh, you don't smoke six. Sorry. I don't smoke six. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, okay. So the formula. 
what is this? This is. Yeah, we opened up for KRS One for fucking Busta Rhymes. Like we did a bunch of dope shit. Um, basically, members of Lettuce doing hip hop beats, like trying to sound like a DJ Premier record, but all full live band. How hard was that to do? Hours of rehearsal. No, so what are you rehearsing in these times to try to emulate that? Loops, sound? loops, like having the feel and the loop and and the the no ego shit where you just are playing as hard as you can and repeating over and memorizing where the drops are for the lyrics. You know, uh -huh. we, we had MCs and shit. You know, Sick. so that was a good good experience, but it was really hard getting an MC to commit to the band. Is they're all like, you know, it wasn't the era where MCs had bands and shit. You yeah. Know? So they were like, nah, man, like you do what you do, we do what we do, and. And I was like, damn, so... And then Kraz kept going, like, yo, I got a gig here. Kraz always has the gigs, you know, he's like... Did he stay in Boston? Did those boys he, stay in Boston? He ended up going to um, Hampshire College, which is, like, you know, an hour from... A couple hours from Boston. So you guys were still homies? Definitely still homies, Okay, yeah. so that the formula didn't work out? Or yeah, did we were gung-ho formula. Kraz was gung-ho lettuce. And Kraz was like, yo, man, like, I got this gig out Hampshire. I got this gig at the Iron Horse in Northampton. I got this gig in Boston. You know, like, I'll pick you guys up. And we were like, oh, lettuce, man, really? You know, we were like, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> what happened to that? Shit. We were all, like, formulated out, you know? And, yeah. And then, um, you know, eventually, Graz, like, had the gigs and the situations. Then he started so alive, and all his situations got bigger and better. You know, like, who to, where, what gigs and where to open for so alive and what to do. And That bummed you out? No, it was amazing. Yeah? It was incredible. So it was never, God, it's, I always thought, Berkeley trained you to be fucking competitive fucking monsters, dude. Uh, I mean, you, I mean, it'll make you break you. Like a lot of people quit and just like I'm not cut out for this, you know. Yeah. But we we were too posseed up to care about that shit. So you had your, you had, isn't that amazing? Like when you're a lone wolf, like I was a lone wolf. My sisters were eight years older than me, mm -hmm. so I always felt like I was just a lone wolf. But when you finally get your group, mm -hmm. you never want to leave that group because like you finally found your brothers. I mean, it's thirty years later. It's fucking, yeah. don't clap to that. Hell yeah. <laughs> 30 years of music, dude. So, what did, so Kraz was telling you, yo, what the fuck? Let's get Lettuce Rock. Let's do it. Kraz was like the main dude, like being like, we got to do this. And, you know, we and we were just into hip hop at the time. We were like, oh, he's got this gig, you know, a bunch of hippies. And, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, I, know, yeah. I, know, I know, I know. But the music was still the funk. Like, Kraz still always wanted to play funk music, you know, with us and let us do our hip hop hybrid funk. So we brought a lot of the formula sound into Lettuce because we were into that. So that's kind of how Lettuce kind of got its sound was combining the hip hop shit that we were doing for the formula and bringing that into like the straight Herbie funk that we were doing with Crass. Okay, so now, when when did y'all quit? Quit. You, or Berkeley. Berkeley, everyone left. I was out, I was done after a year and a half. Okay, same as yeah. everyone or did anyone finish? Uh, Jesus finished. Oh, wow. Yeah, somehow he did. So how were you gigging? Mm -hmm. How how were you just doing weekend gigs until Jesus finished, or did you like go on tours and their his teachers let him get out? <laughs> like, give me the give me the scoop. I need the deets, dude. This is deets. Uh, I, I was uh, in a band called Fatbag and uh, F A T B A G, and people around Boston that are in their forties might know about it. But uh, we started to blow up, and it was like a wild hip hop band with a fronted by a lead singer that was a saxophonist and rapped. Sick. Could sing rap play the fuck out of a sax um and we had a full horn section a dj percussionist drums and guitar did you get a deal we got a full uh full deal from interscope and like you know move, had to drop out of school my parents love the band they're like definitely drop out of school no problem you know the coolest parents ever Thank you know hell yeah you know they were front row at the shows they were convinced we were all convinced this is the band that's gonna do it you know i was 20 not even i was like 18 they were all like 25 26. who's in the band uh, I was fronted by this dude, Alex, who, you know, was kind of the force behind the thing. He was always scouting Berkeley for young guys to get in his band. Smart. You know, and he, he scouted us out. He came to, you know, a gig of mine, and he was like, you want to be in this thing? And, and it was all the older, best musicians in the school and, you know, playing hip-hop, you know, like tight arrangements, four-hour rehearsals a night. And you're 19 and a half? Yeah, something like that, you know. Shit. No money. Like, uh, yeah. You know, but we started selling out shows immediately. We were, like, hitting the stage, like, when you know, you know, it's like a loaded gun when you rehearse that much. Yeah. And you go into the stage, and you guys are just like, they're not ready. Yeah. You know, that feeling. Hell yeah. Like, we put in so much sweat into the, these rehearsals that it's like when you hear about, like, you know, how hard Kobe practiced. Yeah. Or, 
you know, that it's so like, man, they walk into the game. like, <laughs> yeah. That's how we felt with Fatback. That was like the feeling every night. And it started to blow up. And then we started playing New York, started to blow up. Jersey, you know, all, all East Coast. Everything we did was blowing up. Regional. And, and uh, one of the guy that discovered um, Public Enemy, Bill Stephanie, he, he uh, signed us. What was that? What was that dinner like? I mean, it was incredible. We, you know, you're 19 fucking years old, dude. <laughs> T- tell me about this dinner or it, whatever. How I mean, meet he, you? he just like came to one of our gigs and he was like, I'm signing you guys to a deal and, and I'm a subsidiary of Interscope and, you know, and uh, looked and I had dropped out of school. We got a house in, in New York City, you know, for all of us to live in, it's, you know, life changer, you know. And so how long did that last for? About two years. Yeah, yeah, that's still you good. Know, two years of, of riding high, feeling like we're going to make it in life, you know, until we realized there was money missing and yeah. lead singers were getting new stereos and new things and a new wardrobe. And did, you, did he have a different deal than the band or did the he, whole band? Yeah, he, when we got the deal, he said, you guys sign to me and I'm going to sign the deal. Yeah, that's fucked up. You know what I mean? Which is as cool if you present it as... Andy Frasco yeah. and the UN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, not, yeah. No. you know, it wasn't Alex and the fa- and and the band and yeah. the Fatback band. You yeah. know, even though he had, you know, we built it on no money as brothers. Yeah. So that's taught me a valuable lesson. Like when you start something, you know, and you're a main writer. I was writing for it. I was breathe living, breathing it. It was like religion, you know. And you d- you quit your school and your livelihood Everything. to do this. Yeah. And especially back then when the record deals were kind of fucked up. It was so fucked up. Yeah. yeah. So you were, so you realized, so a year and a half in, you realized that you're making way more less money than the, the lead dude. Yeah. It destroyed me, you know, it destroyed me and inch means. And Jesus was also in it, kind of messed with him a little bit. Messed with our psyche, but it also made us bond in a whole different way from lettuce. Cause this, this whole fat back experience was like, I can't believe that three of us were doing this. And we felt the rise and, and how crazy the lead singer was and, and all the drama, you know, and it's fucking nuts. Yeah. And then, so then fucking Krasner came back. What, and, yeah. What, Kras was like, when you guys are done with that crazy lead singer, dude, uh, holler at me. Did you he know? know he had a feeling that guy yeah, was crazy? Yeah, he knew. Kras, he's, fucking, he's smart, bro. Dude, he's Kras so is smart. one of the smartest and coolest dudes ever. On you the know? planet, yeah. On the planet. And he always knew what was up. And we were like, yeah, whatever, man. It's going to be big. Is, he, was he like the older brother style to you? Or always, was he, always older brother. You know, he, he's younger than me, I think. But, he's but just, he just had that mindset. He just, just, he, he's just, a, yeah, he's just on bro. it, bro. He's on it. And he'll, you know, he messes with me like a big bro. You know, he's just like that. You know? So you finally said, fuck this. I'm out of this thing. Out of this How'd thing. How'd you done. get out of that contract? I had to, in order to retain the rights to the songs that I wrote, <laughs> I had to play in the band for an extra two months. Or he would have, the, my songs would have defaulted to him. Holy shit. So you guys hate each other and you guys are fucking playing yes. two months and of music? And it's a brand new band. And oh, all, everyone, you and know, you stayed. I had to stay to get my, my compositions back. Oh my God. That and is I was, so fun. It was so ice cold. The vibe was ice so cold. So after bro. shows, what would you do? Just go back uh, to out, the hotel? Out, yeah. You know. He didn't even say anything? He was just like. It was just, I kept it like professional. Yeah. You know, I'm not like a. Yeah. You know, trying to spite and, you know, I was just like, hey man, good, you know, see you tomorrow. Good gig. Yeah. You know. Then two <laughs> months. Day 60. Yeah. Get my paycheck. I'm Out. joining Eric Krasno and the boys. Yeah. So during those two months, were you, Shmeens and, and um, Jesus, like, all right, we're going to do this? Was there a game that, plan? That was a big motivator. Like, when we do Lettuce and we get back with Krasno, everybody, we're going to really do this, you know? Isn't it amazing, like, when we, our past kind of veer a little bit and then we realize what we missed or don't ha- didn't, you know, what we don't have? Mm-hmm. We don't, we need that. Kind of, it's getting yeah. fucked in a way to know what we missed out on. Absolutely, man. Paul. Thank God it happened 21. Yeah, dude. It, it really, you know, getting off the path, like you said, is important to getting back on. You know, like yeah. you veer, everyone veered, you know, and everyone has done other shit. Everyone's done other tours. And, you know, we just knew that, like, we get back together, it's on. So, you, okay, so it's on. So now you left the band two months in, got your money. Get back with the boys. Did you guys move? Did you all move to New York City, or did you guys? Did, or was Kraz in New York City? Was everyone in New York City at this time? Yeah, Kraz was the first one in Brooklyn. You know, he's like, yeah, yeah. everyone get get here now. You did know? he have that pad that he you said like that yeah. apartment in Greenpoint? Yeah, yeah, you've been there. Hell yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's that's our block. Dude, no shit. So yeah. That's where you guys did all your shit. I mean, in, that in was our main meeting place. Yeah, that was yeah. Me and him live across the street from each other. He, you know, he found me an apartment across the street. 
Okay, God fucking Krasno, dude. What a fucking miracle, man. Yeah. Okay, so now lettuce is starting. It, yeah, it's getting serious. Okay, gig. What was the first agent, gig? You know, like you got an agent. Yeah. So right away, shout out to Josh Knight. Oh, Josh Knight was your guy. Yeah, immediately he was like, "I love you guys," and I was like, "Man, you're like the homie. You love it." He's like, "I'm gonna keep you guys working." You know. So okay, so tell me about that first practice coming back as a new band. What was it like? I mean, it was like, now we're opening for big crowds at Brooklyn Bowl because Soul Eye blew up, you yeah. know? It's oh, not like shit. we're begging to play the basement of Wetlands. Like we, did, we did that already. You know, we played all these little spots in Mercury Lounge and, you know, but now it's like Soul Eye's playing big spots, you yeah. know, and they need an opening band. Instead of them getting an easy opener or a good DJ, they would have like Kraz's boys, you know, like Thick. all 10 of us, you so know. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> and so was so crazy was double dipping then he was totally double dipping God, but you know he knew we wanted to play he knew we had unfinished business you yeah. know like as a band as playing and doing what we did at berkeley in front of people and you do you still remembered that that energy mm -hmm. like what was that first sh give me that take of that first show you had with lettuce like where were you how many people were watching people were freaking out like give me this i mean when we did the wetlands, was Kraz booked us uh, weekly. Shout out to Pete Shapiro. Yeah, applause man. for Pete Shapiro. Let's man. go. Pete the goat. Shappy, if y'all don't know Shappy, he's just a legend. You know, yeah. uh, wetlands on the wetlands, and it was a great club. Like for, you know, everyone from the roots to like fish, everyone you know, everyone played there, and uh, that was our spot. And we we Kraz got us uh, every week for one month. We play once a week. You know, did you guys have money? Were you broke? Totally broke. You know. Just living, just barely getting by. There's no one rich in the band, you know. There's no like, you know, we don't have. There's no uh, big trust, trust fund, no, trust fund like just that. Hard shit. Work yeah, it's just like blue collar cats, you know. So we got this gig, and Kraz got us guests. He got Schofield one night. He got Fred Wesley from the JBs. I'm like, how did you do all this? Like, how? He's just like, don't. Yeah, it's easy. Nothing. You know. Next thing you know, we're playing with our legends. You know, and then Schofield's like calls me the next day, like, man, you know, Kraz set it up, set us up. You yeah. know, on a blind date, you know, basically like on stage. And then he wanted me to tour with him. And, you know, that was a life changer. And yeah. So tell me about those years with Schofield. It's amazing, man. Just like uncle. How old were you? Uh, 25. Something like that. So it was after average wife. Man. Okay. So, so what about, so what about those years, those three years, Lettuce was popping. Were they pissed that you took the Schofield gig? No, nah, because they, they love Sco. You yeah. know, they were like, you're playing with Sco. Everyone loves Sco. Were they and jealous of you? Nah, they were supportive, man. That's good. They wanted to be in there. I wanted it to be Lettuce and Sco. Oh, like, shit. like we go out of Schofield and I have the boys in the band, you know, and he was like, nah, because it'll be a takeover. I want to like, I want to split you guys up and get new guys, you know, like. <laughs> it'll be a takeover. So yeah. I have like these two dudes. I'd I'm never, the captain now. Yeah, he, <laughs> he, he's the boss and we're like the kids trying to do yeah. well, you know. So we got Avi Bordnick, amazing guitar player, Jesse Murphy and Andy Hess were the, uh, guys in the Schofield band, but I had never met them before and we were like new friends and we had to perform for this legend every night. So you, those three years was Lettuce Popman? Were you guys doing regional stuff? Were you starting to get there or was it still yeah. slow grind? The, Kraz was intelligently booking things in between the Schofield dates. Whenever I was off, it was like let gigs, you know? Okay, was Kraz in Schofield's band? Um, he just knew your schedule. Kraz just knew my schedule, yeah. So he was... So he was really the point person in Lettuce for the first... Yeah, he, he had the booking contacts. And then once Josh took that over, he didn't have to do that, mm -hmm. you know. But he, uh, you know, he was always into playing, you know, because he was also doing Chapter 2, which I was in that as well, mm -hmm. which is like his, the Kraz band. The, I remember the that. origins of like Kraz writing tunes, singing a little bit, band leading, you know. Yeah. So I was supportive in that and like trying to get him to that point where he felt comfortable to like just be the man up yeah. there, you know, and call the shots, you know. Okay, so you, how many years with Schofield? Uh, three. Three. So now you're 26? Yeah, about that. Okay, so you're 26. Then what made you guys want to take Lettuce to the next step after that? Uh, Sco was done. He was like, hey, man, thanks for your time. I'm going to do some jazz shit now, straight ahead. That but, bum you out? No. You're it was cool great. Dude. It was time. So thank you, man. It was great. Did you, great were experience. you always like half one in and one out? Or was, did you feel like that was a, like a, a gig, like your first gigs when you were in 20? It put me on the on the map as a drummer worldwide, that gig. Like, it, it, playing with Schofield is a hot seat. And uh, luckily, the music he was playing was, like, drum loop hip-hop shit where I could do my thing and be creative and drum and bass. And, like, I didn't have to be some jazz fusion guy, like, 
Dave Weckl or yeah. Vinnie Caliuta or something, you know, because like, <laughs> yeah, totally. I can't really do that, you know. But what I did was get to play the music I liked, you know, John bass, hip hop, funk, you know, and mess with it and kind of chop it up as if I was cutting it on a sampler, but doing it with the drums. And, uh, and that just kind of caught people's Sick. ear, you know. What, so during those three years, was what were the boys doing? They were they were doing big things. She means to got in the Robert Randolph family band, you know, like Sick. just playing like that amazing church funk rock thing they do. Yeah. You know, they took him in, you know, his family, and uh, he was doing that. Soitis had a record deal with his hometown main band, uh, Rustic Overtones. Is that with um, Lyle? Was Lyle in that band? Lyle was not in that band, but he he, he used to like go to all their gigs, you okay. know. Yeah, yeah. Cause he, uh, isn't Ryan a Burlington cat or something? Or Maine, they're Maine. all Portland Maine. Portland Maine. Yeah, they're like the main crew. And Nigel was part of the main crew, even though he's from DC. He like moved to Maine when he was like sixteen. So okay, so everyone was busy. Everyone's doing it. Doing Schofield big says, I'm "Going doing doing something else," mm-hmm. and that you're like totally cool. You got the boys back together, or you guys had a meeting and said, "Let's fucking do this full time." I, I mean, absolutely. You know. And then Jesus calls one day. He's in New York. He's in the studio with DJ Quick and Wyclef. So sick, dude. You and guys I'm, are all just <laughs> fucking doing it. Well, Jesus is like, he is the number one session bass player for hip hop, maybe of all time. Like, you, really? you look at his, his, you know, his credits, and it goes, like, so deep. You know, if, like the Dr. Dre camp, you know. But then outside of that, like Lil Wayne, Kanye, like, everybody, like, he just has mad credits and he could literally just stay in LA and just not even think about a session. He'll get a call like, Hey man, come on in. You know, we're in here with the game. We're in here with whoever. Did he get you a lot of gigs? Session so work? yeah, he called me and he brought me into the session with quick and Wyclef and then Wyclef, <laughs> you know, was there and he tested me to see if I knew Haitian music. And I grew up with a bunch of Haitians. I grew up in a town, Nyack, where it's just like a lot of big Haitian community. And I was, you know, best friends with a lot of Haitian kids and they, they play compa music, you know, they like compa. And I knew how to play it on the drums. I played it for Wyclef and he's like, you're my new drummer and we're going on tour like next week, you know? So like, it feels like every time you wanted to take lettuce seriously, you kept on getting this Another life gigs. opportunity would like jump there, and, you know, and the guys were like, wow. And Jesus was like, wow, like this, I can't believe. You and know, Wyclef was fucking popping. It was popping. He had the sweetest girl, the new single and the whole shit. Was that the biggest thing you ever did? It was huge. We were playing like amazing gigs. Like, you know, I pulled Dave Grohl up from the crowd and like I had him sit in at the gig, like at this like film festival and like we partied all night. You I know, fucking like fucking love it. It was like all this celebrity shit, you know, hanging out with Akon and like, you know, just like White Clef was deep into that that whole like he just has the most, you know, magnetic personality I've ever been around, you know, like And it feels like you're magnetic to older people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just stay out of the way. Like, I, I'm, you know. You've I, always been like the youngest dude in the band. Mm-hmm. That, that's been my place, you know. Yeah. Isn't that crazy how people, you feel like you're an old soul? I mean, I learn a lot. I, I shut up and listen, you know. I don't, that's, you know, I like to learn things about people and get them talking. Okay. So, Wyclef, now, you, right before <laughs> Lennis gets you full on, you get the gig with Wyclef. How long did that last? That was another three years, man. Oh, my God. Traveling the world with him. And Jerry Wonder, the great producer of the Fugees, and the f- first Fugees reunion with Lauren. I'm in the room. You with, met her? I hung out. Yeah, we totally played, did gigs, studio. What was, what was their chemistry like? Like their, the Fugees chemistry? It wasn't cool. Yeah. You know, but it was cool. At, at the end of the day, they, they did the gigs, you know? They're on tour right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like the difference between, you know, it's a job and... It's a, it's your love and music and whatnot. I just, you think about the bands, like, I just think of like Mick and Keith and stuff, you know, they don't really like each other, but mm-hmm. they do the gig and they fucking, and they have a synergy put the work. with yeah. business and, and, per, and with music, you know, they, they, they can get past the other bullshit and get to what's really important. The music. You know? Yeah. Okay. So three, so now three years later, you guys are get, becoming older adults, what, 27, 28, 29? About that. Yeah. So, like, this idea of lettuce is still throughout, like, we're going to do this full-time, we're going to do this full-time, we're going to do this full-time, and then you, yeah. everyone keeps getting steered away. Mm-hmm. How, how did you keep, 
how did you keep the dream of lettuce going on? I mean, Soul Alive is still going this whole time. <laughs> you know, crazy, like, Kraz was in a van for years, you know, with those guys. Shout out to Neil and Al, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah, let's well, go. Well, let's go. Well. <laughs> you know, and Neil, and Neil was super into lettuce. Like, he, like, really, you know, he, was, he became a member, and he was like, I couldn't believe it because I was like, I worship so I, where Neil was like, it's a genius, you know. Yeah. Left-hand bass while he's playing the right-hand chords and soloing and band, writing all those tunes. He wrote most of the Soul Alive shit, so... He's like, as a composer, he's my one of my biggest influences of like how I try to, you know, like maybe I'll write something like, I really hope Neil likes this, you know, like and yeah. sometimes he would shit on it. You yeah. Know? Like, was he honest I, with you? Abs like brutally. Because you're a little bro. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Him and Kraz are brutally honest. Yeah. So Krazy was was brutally honest? Yeah, you're a little bro. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when was, have you ever, has, has Kraz known or any of those dudes, like you were just like so in love with this one tune and you're like finally bring it to the boys yeah. and then they just shit on it. Absolutely. What, what song was it? Do you remember the worst heartbreak? I mean, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many misses, bro. <laughs> really? And I started writing in bulk and that's what got me writing, like continually delivering, you know, and making them cooler and cooler and studying what they like. Like what kind of sounds is Neil like? You know, oh, this kind of organ, like an old sounding organ with the reverb. You know, the guitar tone's got to be right. There's got to be live drums. Can't be like fake, you know, Pro Tools drums. You know, it's got to yeah. be like real drums. And like, I started making these demos and like over and over and getting better and better and better. And so it's just like got my chops up. You know, some people get get put off by getting rejected, and some people get mad and want to get even. And it's like the fuel. Fuel, absolutely. So was that fuel for you? Absolutely. Um, what about um, if? someone that isn't your big bro starts talking shit. Is that more fuel or is it, do you get more bummed out? I mean, if I, you know, depends on if I'm a fan of their work. Yeah. You know, that's the only time I get bent out of shape. Yeah. You know, if someone, if I'm not a fan of their work, it's like, Whatever. where is this coming from? You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. like uh, what about, uh, so that, that, that's gotta be, that's, that is the greatest men when you're meant, when your mentors are your best buddies yeah. and your big bros. Yeah. I mean, it, it just, it makes you stronger. Yeah. It's got to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, God, fuck, I, <laughs> this is tight. Um, <laughs> all right, so you're 29. What happened with Wyclef? Three years, and um, I got it. I think break science started to pop off. No shit. You know, because I got, got the thing with Borum. And Where'd you meet Borum? Um, in New York. Was uh, he popping? Yeah, dude. He was totally had. A, he was the only dude in New York that could play jazz keyboards and had Ableton chops and samples and you know all kinds of dope dubs and reggae sounds and sirens and effects. You know, and no one had that. Had all that bag. You know, so it was like we started the duo and, and it just started to pop off with the right. You know, shout out to. Were you starting into electric music or electronic music then, or what, what yeah, was Break yeah. Science back then? Break Science, our, our real influence was. Jay Dilla and wanting to like kind of do that live and you know Flying Lotus early Flying Lotus like we we're like damn we'd love to like have some samples and still play you know like create a hybrid of live and electronic that was our thing from day one like oh wait holy shit okay so was Break Science ever like really really popping because you guys were on all the fest this is when I started getting your scene I saw Break Science really mm -hmm. starting to pop off and like getting mm -hmm. a bigger times the festivals and the trajectory uh was really going well you know like with the whole pretty lights shout out to derek and pretty yeah. lights you know like oh, he yeah. he put us down with the with the colorado mob you know like well, yeah you didn't even get to that you were with pretty lights weren't you yeah totally <laughs> what was that another two three years you know it's i feel like your life is threes and sevens dude <laughs> it's like that <laughs> maybe man. Love Maybe. life seven years, uh, music life three, but lettuce has been there the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so was Pretty Lights before Break Signs? No, um, Break Signs was popping. Uh, we had a gig together one night, and uh, I couldn't believe that. I was told that Pretty Lights was a light show, <laughs> and, I, and I was like, "A light show's playing after us? Like, who who are these guys?" Huh. It's like oh eight, oh nine, you know, and we're in LA or some shit. Yeah. And uh, we did a show together, and then I got reached out to by Phil Salvaggio, and he was just like, we want you to join the band. Was you know? Derek popping back then? Derek was like just absolutely straight line up going, yeah, bonkers nationwide, yeah. And, okay, so then you took that gig? Yeah, uh, that was the 2010, yeah. Holy shit. So this idea of having lettuce be the front 
was always the dream. Yeah. But you just kept on having these sidetracks that essentially built your career and made you who And you it made are. lettuce, yeah. you know, people take notice of lettuce. Like, you know, Derek would like bring me out front to the crowd at Red Rocks and be like, this is Adam. He's in lettuce and breaks. Like, you know, support him. You know, like he just was so cool with that shit. Like he, you know, a lot of DJs do not, or, you know, producers yeah. give the shine to the musicians on stage yeah. like that, you know, and he was just like, this is fam, you know, like, <laughs> holy shit. Yeah, and just like, so all of a sudden, the break science thing was like happening and like, and then I knew I didn't have to, I knew I should concentrate on the, on break science and lettuce and then the trajectory started happening at the same time and it was like, okay, now I just have these two things that are incredible that could totally be full time. Yeah. How do I... To both. Were you getting burnt out at this point? I yeah, never th- was home. You were home. I never you, was home. Yeah. yeah. Were you burnt out or? No. Nah. You loved it. It was great. It was a great ride. It's totally great. Okay. So why 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 did you decide <laughs> one over the other? I never did decide one over the other. It's just like drink your water if you have to. Yeah. Let us. <laughs> yeah, let, let, <laughs> Sorry, dude, I, I got so many questions about this. People go break science your side probably like hell no. And that was a fucking full gig. It's a full. It should be full time, but it's like. I got my let thing in so many years, you know, playing funk. It's different sides. I like making beats. I like, you know, playing electronic DJ Shadow, RJD2 type shit, yeah. you know? And I also like playing James Brown type shit, you know? So you felt like that point in your life, you really had a full, your your musical heart was complete in a way. In a way, like, you know, having two, uh, two sides of the game for me and then still doing pretty lights in between the, those two. So how many shows were you doing at 29? It, it was pretty crazy. 300? It, like, if you could see the flights crisscrossing, like, it would just be a giant... And you yeah. never got burnt out? I mean, the flights, you know, to this day, like, the thought of going on a flight for leisure... Fuck it. Like, even to a fucking beach. <laughs> even to, like, Hawaii. You know, anyway, I'm just like, you know what? Fuck the, it. I got to fly for fun, you know? Like, <laughs> I would rather stay on the ground. You know yeah. what I mean? Because I flew so I much it. from 30 to till today you were you know? ever like playing beats from a break science song that you're playing that you like accidentally were playing in another show because you're just like you know was there ever shows where like you played one show break science and oh yeah we toured break science opening for lettuce like mad times like full tours like that was lettuce popping in 09 um it started to pop around 10 11 12 i mean really you know Derek definitely helped a lot. And, you know, oh, you know, Grammatic had us play Red Rocks, like open up for him in Red Rock. That was like super cool of him to do. Did any of the guys in Lettuce feel like, like they were second fiddle to any of your other projects? No, they were all doing big shit. Jesus did wait in the studio with Dre, like, yeah, no problem. Live gigs? What's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's like, you guys play concerts. That's really cool. He's yeah. like, I'm in the studio with rap legends every day. You know, that's, that's insane. Kraz is doing big things, writing with this dude, making making his own records, doing his thing. You know, so Neil's doing soundtracks for you know like all kinds of documentaries. And, you know, so everyone does. You know, survives. And very you still well. haven't drank yet, barely. You know, You're, I mean, d- uh, during the Pretty Lights thing was like me starting to experiment. It was so like, felt like that's a very big party scene yeah, in that area. Starts, yeah. You're starting to get into that world where it's starting to party. It was uh, it was insane. How hard was it to say no to things? It was just like, you know, uh, it was really, you know, I still nothing I've ever experienced for. You know, I was always a very, you know, we took it pretty light, you know, as far as partying. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like. Totally. But that was this was like you know a party bus every night and like it was just wild. Did did you ever get burnt out from that part of it? No, no. Everything no. was just such a great. Experience. It was really amazing. Yeah, at that point, while I had never having done it, you know, and it was at the end of a relationship, and then I was single, and it was just like yeah, that, having fun. It was just yeah. Was yeah. this the first time you were really making a lot of money, um, or a decent amount of money? It was definitely the most money I, I made in a while, you know. But I definitely was flying for it and traveling for it and no You're sleeping for it. You're working your ass off. Yeah. Yeah. You I know. feel like it's like they don't realize like people who make money, it takes so much effort to make fucking money. Yeah. And like, you know, it doesn't just come out of the air unless you're a trust funder, but. Yeah. I, I didn't spend it on anything. I barely bought anything. I just literally just stacked it and just kept working, you know. Yeah. Are you good with money? Um, I, I, I don't spend on things. No. Ubers. Yeah. What do you, That's what's it. your guilty pleasure? Food? 
I, you know, I've been cooking a lot, so I don't spend that much money on food. I like organic food. <laughs> yeah. So I've been trying to cook for Hell myself. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't, you know, I'm, you know, I went shopping today. I bought two pairs of jeans. Yeah, they look good. Shout out to my girl. Who, yeah. Sarah actually took me to the mall, Cherry <laughs> Creek Mall with Nordstrom's. Yeah. I feel first like, time I've been shopping in like five years. I know? feel like people have to stop you and say, hey, we're going to go to the park. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to go get you some jeans, you know? It's like, like that. It's like she's going to get me out of the house and doing normal human things. So you got out of uh, Pretty Lights. Now you just have Lettuce and Break Science. Mm-hmm. So we're, and they're both just, you guys were torn together. You're double dipping. You're doing both shows. Just everything is music. So when did, it felt like, when did Lettuce start doing like becoming your full time gig? Well, I was still, you know, or are you doing production still? Well, the lettuce thing started to really start to, you know, incline. And uh, the, the Grammy was, was a big thing, the getting yeah, nominated for the Grammy. You know, um, it, was just, it was a major event for us. And that changed your band's trajectory after getting that? It validated us in a weird way to each other. Like, you know, because we, repre- we all respect that community. It's, Quincy, it's called the Quincy Jones Award to me. Like, you mm-hmm. know, like, that's really what a Grammy is. He has you know, something like 30, 40 Grammys and he lends, he makes that shit legit to me, you know? And so in in our, in, you know, as friends, we're like, wow, this is like a real thing. You know, this is not, not like a award should validate you at all. That's some bullshit. You know, like, let me go back on that. I'm just saying like, because I grew up watching it every day, my parents, every year, my parents and like it's a major part of so it was just kind of, you know. It's a huge accomplishment for being homies at 16 yeah. in a fucking <laughs> practice studio. Don't give yourself more credit than that, right? <laughs> no, that's, that's a huge accomplishment, dude. And like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, fuck the award. But the mm-hmm. idea that you're getting an accomplishment for the music that you're playing is, you know, that's, that's a bow. I'll I mean, there's a lot of. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Let's go, Deitch. <laughs> there's a lot of my heroes that did not get nominated for a Grammy. You know, it does not make, you know make it any less and we didn't win you know but whatever it did <laughs> I just can't. but uh you know you know it, whatever inspires you inspires you and that and that that's what life's about what is, is that one of the most what's the most proudest thing or accomplishment you've ever done i mean definitely having my parents at the grammys you know and just the lead up to that was probably like good good for them you know i, I just felt like they felt validated finally because I, I was put you know they had high hopes for me being like this big time producer, like what my, what Jeff was doing, yeah. you know. And I had opportunities where I was like in the studio with Justin Timberlake, just you know, one-on-one, me, me, him and an engineer. And I was like his producer, you know. And we were making beats like all day long for like a week and a half. And Is that how that works with those bigger guys? They like, they see what producers they want to play with? Or- I don't even know how I got that gig, man. It's just- I, <laughs> I, like, I, I can't remember. I think really? my manager at the time got a call from somebody that knew him and- they got me in the studio with him. We did a whole record, you know, and this, and then he was like, oh, I got to go to Virginia to work with Timberland. I got to, you know, he wants me to come down. And they did Sexy Back. And that so was what, it. what about the record that you got? Scratched. He just sitting on a hard drive somewhere, you know? Oh, that, that, is that mind fuck? It's kind of fucked. Like, it would have made my career was super soulful. And, and uh, there was this, like, dude with an NPC with all the dope, like, Dilla sounds. And we, we were all, like, we were making, like, some, like, cool Neo Soul shit that wouldn't have sold a lot of records, but it would have been, like, super dope, you know? Yeah. And then it, and then he comes out with, boom, dun 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 You know, like, and I was like, oh, I should have made him some electro funk if that's... And, like, I knew how to fucking write those type of fucking songs, dude. Yeah, I was thinking, like, you know, I was on that, like, Soul Quarians Neo Soul shit, you know? So that bummed me out. Would that I, that would bum me out a little bit. It was it was it hurt a little bit, you know. But what a teacher, you know. Uh, man, sometimes you miss. You know, sometimes you you think it, something's going to happen and and it ain't. You yeah. know, but whatever happened from there, it's like he he still told me he wanted to be he, me to be his touring drummer, and I was like, oh shit, this this is going to be tough to tell the guys when I'm with Justin. Justin wanted you to be his guy. Yeah, like he had me playing in the studio, like tell me this beat, play that beat, play this Randy MC beat, play this, and I was just like hitting him with it. You was know? Blackstone in the band? This, yeah, Blackstone was the MD uh-huh. at the time. Yeah, you were home shout out time. Oh yeah, that was your dude. Yeah, but he he ended up Blackstone ended up going with uh, John Blackwell, rest in peace, one yeah. of the greatest Prince's drummer, John Blackwell. Damn, who was like one of my idols. We went to school. He was like the dude at Berkeley that was like Kobe as a freshman. And, oh, he was the goat. And I was like you know, Keith Van Horn. I was just like, just so, 
you know, Still like, pulling eight times yeah, seven. right, you know, yeah, exactly, doing good. you know, and he would, like, throw the sticks at me and smile, I'm like, you play now, motherfucker, you know, like, was, he was it ever, like, that movie, that drum movie? <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it, no, no. I mean, I got definitely, like, friendly bullied by the better drummers. Because they knew you were good, and they knew potential. Yeah, they wanted me to get into that, like, competition thing where it's like, I, you know, they push me and I do better because of it, shit. You know, meanwhile, it, like, kind of crushed my soul, you oh, know? Yeah. But, uh, it's got to be hard being a kid and, like... I mean, you're still a fucking kid. You could, mm. you could, we could wear a, a badge of armor, or, or we could pretend we're bigger than we are. But really, we're still fucking developing our brains, yeah, dude. That's absolutely, gotta be so fucking I mean, hard. I mean, our, as musicians, our egos are glass. Yeah, you know, and anyone can say one tiny thing, and psh, yeah. your whole shit's just shattered. You oh, know, no, and you're like, up. no, it's cool. It's totally cool, bro. Yeah. you know, but oh, it's yeah, like, I'll do better. Yeah, yes, yeah, no, 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 totally. It didn't bother me at all. Oh. You know, where it's like, fuck. And you're just like, you're you heartbroken. Know? <laughs> like, your heart is just like, fuck. Yeah, you know, when people say, like, hey, man, it was a good show. Yeah. Like, I, all I hear is good, not great. Yeah. And, oh, oh, it was great. Yeah, oh, it was good, huh? And I'm like, oh, thanks, man, so much. But inside, I'm like, fuck. I fucking, what did I get him tonight? What did I do? What did, what did, what did, did, I do? did they hit that fucking snare wrong? I should have practiced <laughs> before the gig, you know, after the do gig. Do better diets. Yeah. yeah. Do be okay. Nah. Tr yeah. Tr I want to go back. I want to go back to this Timberlake thing. He wanted you to be your drummer. Yeah. And what he happened? He told me, and then and then I guess, you know... He told it, you personally, or is Yeah, for like a few months, I was like preparing myself for that, and, you know, and then I guess Blackstone went with, with John Blackwell, which is totally cool, because... So Blackstone hooked you up with Timberlake on that no, world? No, no. I, I didn't even know Blackstone at that time. I just knew Justin wanted me. I, and I know that J Justin probably told Blackwell, like, I want this dude that's in the studio with me to play drums. I mean, you've never heard of him, you know? And they, you know, and they was like, no, nah, we're going to get this professional stadium drummer who I know, John, you know, John Blackwell, who's like, you know, one of the greats and he could twirl, he could twirl sticks. He was like, yeah, just show me. He, he could light up the crowd just by himself, yeah. you know, and that's something I could never do as a drummer. Like I'm not, I have no tricks. I have no, no. bag. You don't need it. Cause you got, I, I mean, I wish I did. I wish I could like, you know, sit in on the show and, you know, and do some shit that the non-musicians could be like, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, you know, I, I don't have anything in my bag like that. No, I'm just like business. I go up there and I'm just trying to make it groove and feel good, like the records I grew up playing along to when I, in my parents' basement. That's why all those dudes picked on you when you were a kid because they knew that you're straight fucking business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, go to work. It's like that meme yeah. of that teacher who walks in and he's he's holding the same t-shirt but it's a different colored t-shirt like going to work. Like <laughs> it's just like <laughs> going back to work with it. They were trying to see what I had in the bag besides a beat. Mm -hmm. You know, and still to this day when I have to like do a drum fill or a drum solo, like I start to have a heart attack. You yeah. know, because it's like, oh, this is that other stuff that the guys do and they you know, Tommy Lee and the, you know, <laughs> flying sauce, whatever, the upside down yeah. drum set. You yeah, know. you're not like that. I just, uh, you know. You were never flashy, huh? I don't, I, I'm just not, I hate flash, man. What uh, about like uh, in your personal life? Yeah, I'm kind of like, just like to play, you know, background chill. I'm not, yeah. never really trying to shine on anyone like that. I don't wear jewelry or big watches or yeah. shit, you know? <laughs> what about like Adam Dite's solo project or something? Yeah, I mean, I, I love doing music projects i have like 15 different yeah. new things going on but uh yeah, i talked to fairman about you I'm like i'm trying I'm, I'm <laughs> shout out to josh fairman right he got yeah fairman. absolutely it's like you're, you're it's great like, bass player amazing great, amazing bass player amazing person amazing engineer mm -hmm. you know just really helped out my whole shit what do you like better producing or um playing live oh man don't do that to me bro don't do that to me, man. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. That's a hard question. I mean, if I don't do one or the other, I'll go fucking crazy. How about that? I'll just leave it at that. So you like, you're a balanced dude. You need to be full circle. On I, I just grew up doing both. My dad was into music production and had all the synth synthesizers and samplers in the house. And like, you know, I had a, a, a Sonic ESQ, you know, ESQ1. Then I had the Sonic sampler, the ASR10. And so I was making beats from like 13, 14, 15 on. Like, so I was really into that. And so that kind of took over from drums. And for, I just always been loving both. So I have to do both. That's good. What about any, have you, do you regret any gigs not, you didn't take? I regret not being a, f a full year round producer and moving to LA and just like, you know, having the beautiful studio by the pool and just, hey, I'm here and I'm ready to make records with all you LA cats. Why can't you still do that? 
because they look at me as like, oh yeah, you're on the road, right? We can't hire you for this, you know? Really? Be, you know, it's like I'm gonna tell my boys that I I gotta make a record for three you know, two months. You know, yeah, I can't yeah. tour. It's like yeah. Oh, so you really are you? Know, you every, you're always thinking of your boys, even absolutely. throughout your projects. That's I, I important mean, to you. What what we yeah what we're here to accomplish is like you know not done. You know, yeah. so we have a lot to do. Like know? what? I mean create a community that's just undeniable and beautiful and peaceful and safe and mm -hmm. cool and into funk and like understanding that you know you know having an audience like earth and fire multiracial audience and and creating a an inclusive vibe at these festivals you know yeah and uh you know getting more bands like butcher brown and and you those know ghost note badass, and ghost note shout out to both those bands and like getting them out on the road. So it's like, you know, what we're doing is not done. So I've, oh, I feel like we all owe it to each other to keep building that. Do you feel like you'll ever stop? So knock on, uh, knock on wood. Not, yeah, <laughs> like not like getting sick or of course. Yeah, but, you know, I, like, I don't see stopping. I, I feel great, you know. You think you'll be on the road till you're 100? I don't see why. Look at, look at Bob Weir, bro. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's loving it. He sat in with Lettuce like the whole gig. We thought he was going to play a song with us at, at Pete Shapiro's festival and like, he stayed the whole gig. He's up there enjoying it, you know, and like, we're playing, we were playing the funky JGB. Is he good? Yeah, bro. He was in it. He was in that group, singing, you know, vibing. That's fucking beautiful. Mayor was in a vibe that day. He was like hanging with me and Nigel and it's like smiling, vibing out. This is, this is insane, guys. Yeah. But you deserve this, man. You were, you dedicated your life from 11 years old. I mean, five. Or know, five, yeah. Playing, yeah. We'll take five years out because you, we had to, you know, you had to do your thing. Had, oh, yeah. yeah. Do some kick flips and fuck. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 360 shove it. <laughs> 360, 360 shove it. Yeah. You don't do that shit anymore? I, uh, I got my boy at the house. I'm just like, I feel like, I, again, I owe it to my boys not to break my wrist. Yeah, true. Being a jerk, you know? Yo, Gerlach, get up here. I want you to ask some, dice some questions. <laughs> yeah, get over here, man. Get over here. Nick Gerlach, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Nick, <laughs> grab your mic. Dude, that's insane. You got you got a little time? You got yeah, 15, cool. 20 sure. minutes? Um, this is this is an amazing story, and it's all music. Yeah. Nothing distracting. Sorry, you. man. No, it's perfect. <laughs> I'm glad. Because there, there, when you put dedication, some people believe like even how much hard work you put into something, sometimes it takes luck. When really you're I'm I'm like that too. I bust my ass every day work on music, work on being in the industry, trying to figure out a way to just be part of this community. And that stuff helped and it works too. And that's part of the dream too. If you put yourself out there 120% and not just do 60% in something, I really feel that you could build your own life, right? I mean, absolutely. You're, you're living proof, man. <laughs> you know, like Appreciate you're it. putting so much into the road and like, and into the, you know, the videos and all the stuff you're doing, man, it's like really, you know, inspirational to all the homies, you know, Bloom and Nick and myself included, you know, so it's really about, you know, how much you put into the thing. Like I'm, I'm at home writing lettuce tunes all the time. You know, I'm making break science tracks, sending up to Borum, Borum going, you know, why don't you say that for your solo shit, Don? You know, I'm like, damn, I was like, I really thought this would be a great, okay, all right, man, you know, uh, you know, it's like, damn, you know, my friends are just real, they're just so real. Well, that's good. I, I mean, love it, I love it. I rather thing. wouldn't want anyone <laughs> kissing your ass, you yeah, know? Yeah, no, like, no, no, that's yeah. That's not a friend. Yeah. You need someone to be honest with you, that's what, what a friendship that's is. That's what they're there for. It's I'm crazy. Not too honest. Hey, Nick, Nick Erlock here. Hey, what were you guys talking about? <laughs> <laughs> music. I'm uh, we're talking music and how dedication. Yeah, let's smoke another yeah, one. We yeah, got, we got time. about past that shit. Yeah, past that shit. <laughs> um, I'd love to be dedicated someday. The reason why I wanted to talk to you because <laughs> I've been talking man. with Nick so much and he speaks so highly of just your work ethic and stuff. It's I'm pretty extremely insane. high when I talk about you. <laughs> I mean, Nick, Nick, Nick what did you learn about Deitch? What did I learn about Deitch? Well, here's the thing about <laughs> Deitch is I knew I was a fan of Deitch before I met Deitch. Because mm -hmm. when you're, when you play saxophone in the 2000s, there's like four cool bands mm -hmm. that aren't jazz. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like Lettuce. I don't know. That's probably it, actually. <laughs> okay. So I was really into Deitch before I was even like a touring musician. And then oh, thank you, Nick. Thank I got to open for him and then we became, you know, friends, I guess, at least acquaintances. Yeah. So now I guess the the allure, you know, the 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 gossamer 
thing around him. Now I know him as a person. So what are you asking me? What do I like about him? No, I'm not. This isn't a date, dog. This isn't a fucking date. I'm not hitting your cigarette. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, just, I'm asking like if like what have you learned from do you, work ethic oh. from Deitch? Well, Deitch beats don't quit. <laughs> What's that mean? That's his slogan. It's not my slogan. It's, what does that mean? It's definitely your slogan. No, shout out to uh, this girl, Heather. She used to be a bartender and, a, and a, she used to come to all the shows out here in Denver. And she's kind of a legend. And um, she was, you know, super left field, but funny as shit. And she made these pins, go, as I say, diet beats oh. don't quit. She started handing them out to oh. everyone in Colorado. Well, she thought of it, but it's your slogan. It's, it's become a thing people just started saying. Yeah. Well, Deitch is different. You know, he's always <laughs> creating. Seems like a lot of people Here's the thing. want to make beats like Deitch. Yeah, because he's one of the best. We're having drummers. a podcast while Dyke is here. It's <laughs> fine. We'll Hopefully, talk. they make I beats like themselves. You, know you know ever me? get pissed off when people rip you off? Um, the, I, I, why would no. they? Here's why the would they? Why would they? Um, you kind of have to rip Dyke off if you want to be a good drummer. <laughs> that's some bullshit. If you want to play man. in the R and B, well, no, not because of who you are and that stuff. And because, yeah, because, yeah, because we, you have learned the tradition the right way. So if you want to learn the tradition the right way and play the music the right way, you're going to sound like Dyke in some ways because I mean, he studied the masters. So you have to study the masters to be good at stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you're gonna, there's going to be some crossover. I mean, everyone knows if you study the greats, you know to have your own sound. Yeah, whatever it is. But you're still you know, be, that's what's more. That's the most important. There's shit. still an attitude and stuff that you have to have. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, you definitely you know got to be focused. If but, you want to be a great jazz saxophonist, you're going to play some Charlie Parker shit sometime. You have yeah, exactly. To, there's a know, language that you. Have but to you learn. hope for people that are younger than you that they find their own shit, and if you are a path of that you know, or a piece of that recipe of their recipe that they're, they're cooking, making their stew and you're a piece of that. That's cool. The that's thing about Dice too, is he's always writing. Right. So, and I, I think there's a problem with a lot of people I know, especially in the like producer community where they're like waiting for inspiration to strike them, to write their album. Mm -hmm. Whereas like people like Dice and I, I try to be this way. You have to write every day. It's not like that. You have to be digging every day, and then you'll find the gold. It doesn't just like come to you. It doesn't like it's not Amazon. You yeah. don't wait for the delivery <laughs> yeah. of it. You know what I mean? So, or if you have that tiny idea, you just like go for a walk to the store. And yeah, you, and you hear that bass on your. Yeah. You got to get it down right away, though. You got to sing that to your phone. Then you got to turn that into a demo, and you take it to the furthest place. Don't let that fly away. Yeah. That little guitar riff in your head, mm -hmm. those three words you thought of, and that, and that Uber ride home. Okay, so yeah. now you have you that know. baseline. So in your part, in your brain, do you departmentalize what where I'm taking this song? Yeah, like absolutely. am I taking it to lettuce? Taking it to break science? Am I taking exactly? Yeah, give the, it to the, me. Uh, you know, you start with the baselines. You know, if it's a funky thing like the one I just sang. You uh you sing it into your phone and you do a little mouth drums, you know, do a little beatbox, however you have to do it to get that beat and the tempo locked down. Now you have the meat and potatoes of a fucking song, mm -hmm. you know, and then you take that to whatever you use, Fruity Loops, Pro mm -hmm. Tools, Logic, and you fumble your way through it. I might spend three hours on a one bar guitar line, you know, one bar guitar part and... I'm playing one note at a time. There's eight different tracks open for me to do one thing at a time, but to get it where it sounds like Shmeen's playing the guitar. It's in the mm -hmm. details. You know, and yeah, and it's like the pocket's got to be right in there because they're going to hear this, and if it's not in the pocket perfectly, they're going to be like, take get the shit out of here. I would not yeah. want to bring it Or what song. about even like during quarantine when you're writing songs? Normally, you guys are with each other when you're writing tunes. Like I mean, that's how we used to write, and that's, that's how we also write a lot, but I, I just started getting real kind of obsessive with like presenting tunes to them. Yeah. And they were just like, shit. They just kind of were like, fuck it. We got to play these tunes. You know?